Thank you. Any questions on my life? <laughs> well, I want to thank uh, the organizers of this, uh, of this symposium for inviting me. I'm, I'm very honored. Uh, I'm also hard pressed. I've got six hard acts to follow here today. Uh, the, the previous talks I thought were, were excellent. And congratulations to all of the uh, uh, competitors. And may the best one win. I'm not a judge, so I have no, uh, no influence. Um, when, when I was asked to do this, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Um, what I do at DuPont Nutrition and Health is I, being a, a food microbiologist, I work in the food protection group. And in food protection, what we do since, since I come from Danisco, which was an ingredient company, is to do work with the industry using ingredient-based interventions for control of microorganisms in food. So in other words, antimicrobials. Um, so a couple years ago, a couple colleagues and I wrote a paper for Food Protection Trends about really a, it was a guidance document for the industry because so many people think you can just throw this stuff in the food and it's going to work. But there are so many considerations. There's so many things you need to think about um, when, when doing that. Because ultimately, if you don't, you're going to fail. And that's with, with really most any ingredient. You have to understand what you're doing. So I want to take that approach here. I've got two things here. This is my light. It's a bright light. And this is my control. So, so don't be alarmed. Can everybody hear me? I know I, I'm. I'm kind of a loud mouth and I tend to like to talk a lot so um, Pete said he would have a hook if I if I ran over time uh, hopefully I can make this semi interesting for you what I want to do here's here's what I want to talk about today um, I always start with hurdle technology now that's something that's hurdle technology you hear that bannered around does everybody have a good understanding of what hurdle technology is I heard it a couple times in talks today, uh, hurdles, talk about hurdles, talk about the technology. I, I wanted to just go over that because that is really a very, my central tenet. It's my basis for how we design foods for safety and quality, okay? Wanted to go over some antimicrobials. I have a, a list there, short list. These are the ones that I have uh, experience with. Um, all the way down to protective cultures and fermentates and then some data. So I, I just want to get going here. Why do we care? Okay, a couple talks today, you, you heard these numbers. I'm going to put them up again. Foodborne illness in the U.S. This is in the U.S. This is a CDC data. They updated about every five to seven years. The latest update was in 2011. And they state that in the U.S., 48, 48 million people get sick. 128,000 are hospitalized, and 3,000 die per year. Okay, what does that mean? That's just the tip of the iceberg. These are the reported cases. These are the cases that they, they know that they can link to foodborne illness. Foodborne illness prevalence is probably vastly higher than this. Most foodborne illnesses are underreported, misdiagnosed, um, People get the 24-hour flu or the stomach flu. What is that? It's probably something you ate. It goes away after a few days, but guess what? You probably won't go to work. You stay home and recover. So there's productivity loss. There's a lot of money lost due to foodborne illness. And then look at the second statement. Approximately 25% of all food produced globally is discarded annually due to microbial spoilage. That's a lot of waste. We're at 7 billion people now in the world. We're going up to 9 billion by 2050. We got to feed these people. If we could eliminate that, or a big chunk of that, just think how far that would take us. At DuPont, that's what we're trying to do. One of the, the, the new DuPont, okay, I, I don't work for a chemical company. I work for a company that's a life science company. They're trying to redefine themselves. Okay, what do we do? We're trying to feed the world. That's one of the pillars and reduce waste. And this is one place where we can start. 
So again, we get a very huge economic impact. And for the past 11 or 12 years that I've been working with antimicrobials, what have I been hearing from the industry? How do I get my chemicals out of my food? How do I get sorbate out? How do I get benzoate out? How do I clean up my label? How do I go all natural? If I put sorbate in there, I can't, I can't put all natural. So they want alternatives. And so back in 2004, 2003, Danisco, the original company I was with, started a program to try to develop a line of natural antimicrobials that would serve the food industry and help answer some of these questions. So the challenge here, improve microbial safety and quality of food supply, of the food supply using natural and or clean label alternatives. So in the industry, how do we define food protection? Your food protection, food protection. To a couple of dimensions, there's the microbiology, microbiological aspect, and then what I call the oxidation aspect. These are the main ways that food can go bad, okay? From a food preservation or a food quality standpoint, we have the maintenance of organoleptic quality of food throughout its shelf life. And that can, that can span either or or both. Okay, you can get rancid foods, lipid oxidation, or you can get spoilage by microorganisms. If you go down on the food safety side, that's a reduction of the pathogen risk for food throughout its shelf life. That falls under microbiology for the most part. That's what I do. This is, this is my world over here. I don't like that stuff over there. We have, we have uh, antioxidant folks at our company. We do sell antioxidants, but I let them deal with that. So if you have any questions on antioxidants, I can find you the right person to talk to. All right, hurdle technology. How do I define it? Some people call it combination technology. It's a combination of treatments and or ingredients used to enhance the shelf stability, safety, and quality of foods. And parallel to that, it's meant to minimize the effect on the sensory qualities of foods. Okay, what do I mean by that? Yeah, you can make your food super safe and inedible. Drop the pH down to, to a level that no one will eat it. You can sterilize it. You can, you can, make, you can make your food safe. But the trick is, will the consumer buy it and eat it? So you have to balance the hurdles that you put in there. So generally, from my world, hurdles are meant, generally meant to eliminate or inhibit the growth of unwanted microorganisms in food. Typical hurdles used for, in food, temperature control, whether it's your thermal process, pasteurization, uh, or your storage temperatures, cooling, freezing, refrigeration. You can control the atmosphere. Put in reducing agents, you can uh, uh, control the redox potential, or you can use modified atmosphere packaging. Control the moisture. The more water you take out, the more control you have over microorganisms. You measure that in water activity, not in moisture. Water activity is what's important for the growth of microorganisms. pH control, generally lowering the pH will give you uh, better control, but not always. There are organisms that nice, that will grow nicely at low pH. I don't want to get in people's ways here. Maybe if I go over here, that light keeps shining in my eyes. Chemical control agents, we're talking things like sodium chloride, uh, organic acids, uh, vinegar, things like that. Other ingredients, spices and extracts, essential oils, you saw one of the talks earlier. Uh, these can have antimicrobial properties and antimicrobials, what, and I'll define that. I'll, I'll give you some examples here uh, as we go along. Other hurdles. I like to argue that you can expand hurdle technology beyond what you're doing directly to the food. You can, you can look at it as anything I do to control the safety and the quality of my food. Look at it as a, as a big picture. What are some of the things a food manufacturer has to, for control? Cleaning and sanitation of their, of their plant. It's very important. HACCP programs, GMP programs, design of the process. 
I've been in more plants where I've seen that equipment that was inherently flawed, that was just waiting for a problem to occur. Hard to clean, can't take it apart. Um, pest control can be looked at. You can get organisms uh, introduced in your plant through, through insects and rodents. Traffic flow, and I mean, when I say traffic flow, I mean the flow of the traffic of the people that work in the plants. In a meat plant, in a processed meat plant, you, you keep the raw and the, and the cook separated, and you control the flow of traffic between them so you don't have cross-contamination. And any, and my question mark, any other thing that you can think of that, that will help you control this? You can look at this as a scaffold. Your prerequisite program is really a hurdle technology at its best. You put it together properly. So let's talk about natural antimicrobials as hurdles. Some examples, organic acids and their salts. Yes, organic acids can be chemically synthesized or they can be natural. And we're talking about those, those organic acids that, you, that are derived from fermentation sources, from, from natural sources. Bactericins, I'll define those in a second. Who's f who are familiar with bactericins here? I know you are, Pete. <laughs> I'll define those and, uh, w uh, because they're very important for what we're trying to do. Antibiotics, yes, an antibiotics generally, you try to keep them out of foods, but there are cases where antibiotic type uh, materials can be used in food as preservatives. Enzymes. Even bacteriophage, I know in the meat industry, you're, you're, there's been a lot of activity with use of bacteriophage against pathogens for use as topical um, agents to control those pathogens. Then others, plant extracts, essential oils, uh, things like that, uh, more less defined and less uh, developed. So how do they work? Multiple hurdles. We look at four hurdles in this graph here. Reduced water activity, lower the pH, lower the temperature, and use antimicrobials. So you look at it as, you know, like hurdles in a, in a foot race. But what is this? This is, a, this is a growth curve. Here's a log of the cell number, and here's time. So with no control, no preservation process, you might get a, a growth curve. This would be of your spoilage organism, for example. And as a, you've all learned in, your, in the excellent food microbiology that uh, Dr. Mariana teaches here, when you look at growth of microorganisms, you look at the bacterial growth curve, you look at the lag phase, you look at the exponential growth phase, and eventually you get the stationary phase. But if, if we, want to look at, we want to look at this graph and say, okay, what, what do we mean here? So once the organisms get to a certain population, we're gonna call that the end of the shelf life. We're gonna call that, that's the point where you get spoilage, okay? So when the organism, the population grows to this, to this level, your food starts to spoil. So what happens when you start bumping up the hurdles? Well, look what happens here. You start seeing a change in the growth. And we'll just go step by step, and in general, as you add more hurdles, you start shifting that curve over to the right. Why is that? Well, if you think of what the lag phase is, what is the lag phase? That is the time needed for a population of bacteria to begin growing in an environment and overcoming the stresses of that environment. So what are we doing when we put hurdles in? We're adding more stressors to that environment. So you add more stress to that cell, it's got to push through more uh, challenges to start growing. And what that does is that increases the lag phase. So all, all we're doing is we're increasing the lag phase here. Once that lag phase, once that population overcomes the stresses, it starts growing. In general, once they're overcome, it'll grow at about the same rate. But look what happens as we're pushing this over to the right the time needed to get to spoilage becomes longer and longer. So that's how, that's how you increase shelf life. That's the strategy. It's also a very simplified way of looking at it. This is kind of what you really see when you get out there and you start measuring growth. Populations can, can 
grow in different ways. So the control, this, we saw this in the last graph. You can have an extended lag phase, that's, we saw that as well. Well, you can also have reduced growth rate and final level, not just increasing the lag phase, but, but actually changing the slope of growth right here. If you have total inhibition, you can get a static effect where you get no growth over the shelf life. And if you have a sidle effect or an activation effect, you actually kill off part of that population and you, you really start, you, you're pushing that lag phase really down lower. Uh, you're pushing the population to begin that lag phase. And when it recovers, it's recovering from this point. Or you could have initial sidle effect and regrowth over time. So you see all kinds, you see all kinds of things here uh, when you get out and you start playing with these, these organisms. That's what makes them so fascinating. I want to spend some time here on considerations for the use of antimicrobials in food. And I, this is really the heart of, of my talk here. So I'm going to spend some time on this, uh, on this list. So when you are out there and you're producing a food and you want to use an antimicrobial, what are some of the things you really should be thinking about? In no particular order, I'll go through these. The first one I have ease, ease of use. How easy is it to use? How, how easy is it to take it out into your plant and get it into your food? If it's a powder and you have a really high humidity plant environment, is that powder going to clump? Can it mix in? Can, it, can you get it into your process efficiently? It's very, very important. We had, one of the antimicrobials we, we had been working with was a great antimicrobial. However, it was a powder, and uh, after about a month, you open up the bag, and it was a con block of concrete. How do you work with that? It's something we have to overcome, right? Effects of the food matrix. So when you put it in your food, you put an antimicrobial in the food, what's going to happen? That matrix is very complicated, very complex. Are there things in the matrix that will bind, tie up your antimicrobial? You have to understand the nature of your antimicrobial, the nature of the components of your matrix. If you have a highly lipophilic antimicrobial, it might partition into the fat phase if you have an emulsion. And your unwanted organisms are probably going to be in the water phase. So you can, you can get physical separation, you can have the best antimicrobial in the world, but if you can't find your target in the food matrix, it's not going to do you any good. Organoleptic effects. Is it going to taste like cinnamon when you put it in? Or is it going to, what's it going to do to your food? It's not just flavor. Is it going to affect the texture? Is it going to cause your phases to separate? Is it cause your meat to cinerese by dropping the pH? These are things you have to understand. Because again, the antimicrobial effect is the last thing to consider. Because you can put it in your food and it can be a great antimicrobial, but again, if nobody's going to eat it or buy it, it's not going to matter. Processing effects. What effects will the process that you use to produce your food have on the antimicrobial? Is it heat sensitive? Will it, will it survive the thermal process? Will it lower, uh, will it lower the, P or will, will something happen to uh, cause it to um, physically alter the food? What will your process do to the antimicrobial? Hopefully nothing. That's what we want. But you have to understand what that interaction is. I, I've put cost and cost in use. There's a big difference here. Especially when we work like with a purchasing agent for a company and we go in and we say, this antimicrobial that we have costs $1,100 a pound. Well, what's the purchasing agent going to do? They're going to go, that's way, I, I, can't, I can't pay that. I, I, I'm buying sorbate, it's cheap as dirt, and you want me to pay $1,100 a pound. Then you tell them, well, but you only put it in at five parts per million. 
That's cost and use. That's where the scientists, the product developers in the company, that's where you work with them so that they make their CEO and their business understand that, yeah, we're paying a lot of money up front, but this thing's gonna last a long time because we're using it at such a low rate. It's only gonna add a penny a pound or two pennies a pound. What else? Regulatory consideration. We have some regulatory folks here today. Can it be used in my food? Is it allowed? Is there a limit? We have a couple of purified antimicrobials that I'll talk about that have a limit for use. They, there's a, a, a thing called the ADI or the accepted daily intake um, that we have, to, we have to fall under. So the regulatory consideration is something you have to do up front. Again, it does no good if you have something that works really, really well and you find out that they're not gonna let you use it in your food. And finally, the label. Most folks want, to, want that decision or the effect on the label to be transparent. In other words, don't change the label at all. But realistically, if you add another ingredient to your food, it'll probably go in your ingredient statement, which means you're gonna to have to change the label. And so planning for that is something that's very imperative. And what does that label look like? Is it going to confuse the consumer? When I, when I say the label consideration, this is when I talk about a clean label. You don't want the consumer to look at the label and be confused at what you have and not buy the product. And Lord knows today with, with uh, the way communications are going around the world on social media, things like that get picked up very, very quickly and are questioned by people who don't know how to ask the right questions. We'll leave it at that. Any questions? Any discussion? Are you awake? Yeah. All right. All right. I'll give you a few examples. Uh, like I say, I work for a company that makes antimicrobials, so the antimicrobials I know are the antimicrobials we work with. I'm not here to try to sell you antimicrobials. I've taken all the brand names off. So we'll talk about the antimicrobials, antimicrobials themselves, what they can and cannot do for you. Um, try to fit across the whole, the, pretty much the food industry spectrum. We have the cheese maker, we have the butcher, and we have the bread maker. Those are, I guess, three of the biggest categories of cheese, meat, and bread. And then we have the bad guys down here. Well, I'll, I'll put that on next time. <laughs> when I joined Denisco 11 years ago, one thing was ver became very apparent. The company I joined was very, very good at, ferment at food fermentations. There was a lot of smart people that knew how to run fermenters, knew how to put fermentations together. So when we started putting together our food protection program, we thought, well, what's a good place to look for natural antimicrobials? Let's look at the world of food fermentations. Let's look at the organisms that are used to make our fermented foods or our cultured foods. Um, and for the most part, those are lactic acid bacteria. So for example, in dairy, we use lactococcus, we use lactobacillus, we use leuconostoc to make cultured dairy products. I put propioni bacterium in here. Now, somebody's gonna raise their hand and say, that's not a lactic acid bacteria. No, it's not. But we lump it in here because it's used in dairy fermentations as if it were a lactic acid bacteria. So we kind of cheat a little bit and put it in here because we like propioni bacterium. In meats, you use pedicoccus and lactobacillus to make things like summer sausage, salami, pepperoni, Fruits and vegetables, you use lactobacillus, leuconostoc, pediococcus to make things like pickles and sauerkraut. Um, fruits, you can argue wine is a fruit fermentation, right? Yes, it's yeast fermentation, but there is a, a fermentation that's used in wine that's called the malolactic fermentation uh, to reduce acidity of certain wines, and that's done by lactic acid bacteria. It used to be called leuconostoc, now it's called enococcus. I didn't put that up there. Even breads, you have sourdough breads. Sourdough breads are basically 
use or are made using the ability of lactobacillus to produce uh, lactic acid and other types of acids. And even silage, uh, lactobacillus is used to make silage uh, more digest easily digestible by animals. So this is what we be what became our basis for commercial the commercialization of fermentation based antimicrobials. So I'll start with this diagram. You'll see this a few times. It's very simplified. We start with an organism that's a single cell. That's not a capsule or a pill. That's the only way I could think of to, to generate it on, at the time with the, my limited computer skills. Um, so this is a coccus. This is a lactic acid bacteria that has interesting antimicrobial properties. Say you grow it on a plate and it shows when it, it, it shows the ability to uh, inhibit the growth of listeria or yeast or mold or something like that. So you say, that's oh, interesting. I want to see what's going on. So as you develop this, there's two routes that you can go. You can go this way. You can make biomass, grow it in a fermenter, concentrate the live cells and sell the live cells in what we call protective cultures. I'll say a few words about that in a little bit. Or we can go this way we can grow it up in the fermenter and then we can kill the cells and we can disrupt the cells and collect what we call the metabolites or the end products of that fermentation and go further and purify out interesting molecules that we might find that this organism makes. Whether they're bactericins, organic acids, enzymes, peroxides, whatever. Whatever we find right, that's making that, that activity. So I want to talk about a couple of purified antimicrobials that, that we have collected in this way. The first one is a bactericin. So I'll define bactericins. So there will be a test. This is the formal definition that I like to use. Extracellularly released, I have to read this, I'm sorry. I didn't memorize this myself. Extracellularly released, ribosomally synthesized, low molecular weight peptides or protein complexes produced by bacteria that in low concentrations are able to kill closely related bacteria. This is the most common type of bacteria that's found. So it's a bacteria killing bacteria. Why do bacteria kill bacteria? It's all a matter of competition. These are produced in environments where there's a lot of competition for the food source and the bacteria will do anything that they can to outcompete their, uh, their neighbors. And in general, the bactericins that are produced kill bacteria that are closely related. In other words, that will be competing for the same food source. So a lot of the bactericins produced by lactic acid bacteria basically kill other lactic acid bacteria. By definition, the producer doesn't want to kill itself, so it has an immunity gene. Uh, it keeps it from killing itself and being able to thrive in the environment. We're not really interested in this. What we want are broad spectrum bactericins. If we want to use them as an general antimicrobials in foods, we don't want to target a, a single type of organism. We want this to be as broad as possible. So the broad spectrum uh, bactericins are the ones that are uh, most interesting and the most well-known one is nicin. Now, people here have heard of nicin. I think some of you have worked with nicin. Nicin is a bactericin. It's the only commercially available bactericin, um, only one that's been purified and, and, and made available for sale. Um, it's also been around for a long time. It was, I think, discovered in the 30s, back in like 1936. It's been uh, commercialized since probably the, uh, the 70s to, and, or 80s. When you look across lactic acid bacteria, you pretty much have the spectrum. You can find bactericins being produced just, just about by, by all spectra. So there, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of bactericins that have been isolated, uh, discovered, isolated, and lots of papers out there. You go out into the literature, and everybody has a paper on a bactericin isolated from some food source, okay? There's a lot out there to pick from. Most of them, unfortunately, are very narrow spectrum. We look at the bactericins of lactic acid bacteria. Now, 
Lactic acid bacteria aren't the only class of bacteria that produce bacteriocins. In fact, most bacteria have bacteriocin producers, both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. But again, we want to stick into, into the food grade and into the, those cultures that are already used in food so that we don't have to worry about trying to get them approved because they're from a non-food source. It's a little bit easier path if you can uh, uh, do it that way. But here we have, the, actually Dr. Kleinhammer proposed this uh, uh, about 20 years ago maybe, maybe less than that, uh, as a, a classification scheme for the bacteria from lactic acid bacteria. We're only interested in a couple classes here. Class one, which what we call the lantibiotics or the lanthionine containing bacteriocins, and class 2A, which we call the Listeria active peptides. The other ones are interesting. There's some uh, academic interest there. Um, you, can, you can write papers on those. But as far as for application in real life food, these are the two that, that we have found uh, to be utilizable in the food industry. Is that a word? <laughs> nicin, nicin A. Uh, I want to talk about that because again, we are one of the companies that have commercialized this. It is a bactericin, has 34 amino acids, so it's very small. It's produced by Lactococcus lactis subspecies lactis. Cheddar cheese starter culture, right? So there are strains of Lactococcus lactis that produce nicin. It is a class one bactericin, so it's what we call a lantibiotic. And it's pretty specific. It inhibits gram-positive bacteria, including spore formers. So it's broad spectrum among gram-positive bacteria. Go down further, the producer strain is regarded as safe, non-toxic. Uh, it's, it's been approved for use in its purified form. So all the toxicology studies uh, have been done over the years. Uh, no cross-resistant related to therapeutic antibiotics. That's always something people look at. Well, if I use this in food, am I going to get antibiotic-resistant bacteria as a result? And that's not been shown. Since it is a protein or peptide, it's degraded during digestion, which is nice. And it's because of its structure and its size, it's also very heat stable, especially at low pH. So this is what it looks like. Uh, nicin has a couple domains. It has a a hydrophilic domain here and a lipophilic domain on the carboxyl side. And in the middle, it's what we call the hinge region. So the, the protein's ab able to move around that hinge region. Uh, there are a couple uh, vari variations that are available commercially of nicin, nicin A and nicin Z, uh, or as my European colleagues call it, nicin Z. Uh, the only difference between these two is right here. There's a uh, Asparagine and nicin Z instead of this histidine here at position 27. Um, what difference does that make? Well, in activity, they're both very, very close. I mean, they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty identical. You do see some physical differences of diffusion and things like that. You can separate them physically. Uh, the point is nicin A is the one that's been around since the 30s. That's the one that was discovered. That's the, uh, the structure that has gone through all the toxicology and um, all the studies, so all, all the early papers are on nicin A, um, and that's the one we produce. Um, but anyway, that's beside the point. But you see it does have a, unusual amino acids here. And the reason it's called a lantibiotic, it has this structure called lanth a lanthionine ring, which is right here in this one. And, and so there are, there, are, there are a handful of these out there. Um, and the, the ribosomally synthesized part are really the, the, uh, the changing of these amino acids. But anyway, I'm not a biochemist, so I won't go there. But anyway, this is what it looks like. Spectrum of activity. Gram-positive bacteria. These are examples of ones that are sensitive. The first three are spore formers, Clostridium bacillus and Allocyclobacillus, uh, all important in food. Um, it is work is very effective against listeria. Um, Micrococcus, lactobacillus, or in general, lactic acid bacteria. Um, Brachothrix, which is a, a meat spoilage organism. These have all been shown to be sensitive. Gram-negative bacteria are resistant. And um, 
Anybody care to guess why that might be? Before I even tell you the mechanism of action. What's the difference between gram positive and back gram negative bacteria? No, cell walls are the same. I mean, but the gram negative cell wall is a lot thinner than the gram positive. What is the gross structural difference between gram negative and gram positive? What does a gram negative have that a gram positive does not have? No? No takers? It's got an outer membrane. Remember? That's where the lipopolysaccharide is. So there's an outer membrane, cell wall, and an inner membrane. So when we look at the, oh, and uh, so gram negatives are resistant and as are yeast and molds. So mechanism of action, I said that uh, we have a uh, hydrophilic and a, and a lipophilic domain. So here's the end terminal. Uh, Nicin binds to a cell wall precursor molecule. It's called lipid 2. Uh, so it's one of the building blocks for the cell wall. It's the same in gram negative and gram positive bacteria. It's produced on the inside of the cell, transported through the membrane where it's used out here to build the cell wall. So for a short period of time, it is a membrane-bound molecule. Well, it's this molecule, and when it's membrane-bound, that nicin can find and bind to, and the, the hydrophilic end binds. You got that hinge region here. What happens to the lipophilic end? It wants to find fat. So it unfolds into the membrane. So if you get enough of these molecules in the vicinity, you're going to produce pores or holes in the membrane and you're going to get leakage from the inside to the outside. Okay. So now again, why does why don't gram negatives why are gram negatives resistant? That outer membrane. Well, in order for nicin to work, it's got to get to the inner membrane. It goes through the cell wall just fine. Cell wall is very porous. It physically cannot go across that outer membrane. It just, there's just no mechanism for it to do that. So the outer membrane is a physical barrier for gram negatives. If you were to put in some EDTA or some citrate, and if you were to chelate the magnesium ions from the outside of a gram negative bacteria, you would remove that outer membrane, and voila, that cell would be sensitive to nicin. Works great in the lab, it doesn't work in food. There's too many other divalent cations out there to tie up your nicin. Nicin also works on spores. Mechanism is not as well understood, but it binds to the spore surface and it prevents uh, this part of the spore life cycle. So it basically uh, prevents outgrowth of the spore. So in a spore former, there are two targets, the spore and the vegetative cell, because if you get any vegetative cells that make it through or escape this mechanism, those are now also going to be sensitive to nicin. So in general, spore formers are more sensitive than non-spore formers. Efficacy. I just want to spend a couple minutes on this first one. It's either bactericidal or bacteriostatic against vegetative cells. Do you think about nicin is producing this uh, molecule to build cell walls? And that's the target when it's in the membrane. So when the cell, when, when would you expect to see a lot of targets in the membrane? So if the cell's not growing or if it's growing? When it's growing, right? When the cell is growing, the faster it grows, the more cell wall it's building, so more, the more precursors it needs to synthesize and transport out because it's dividing fast. If it's, if it's not growing or if it's growing very slowly, there's no need for these, and so it, it slows down that mechanism. So in, a, in an actively growing cell, you have a lot more targets for nicin, so actively growing cells are more sensitive to nicin as far as uh, the killing effect, as far as punching holes in the membrane. Now if you have a stationary phase or a lag phase or just a, a slow growing, uh, a slow growing cell, you're still going to have precursor molecules. There's, there, there's never zero percent. They're going to be there. And they still, pro they still provide a target, but not enough to, to, to form pores, but enough to keep that cell from growing anymore. So that's what I mean to say that, that if a cell's more actively growing, 
which is the second point here, it's more easily killed than a cell that's growing less actively. And, and those, niacin tends to be more uh, static. So that's what I mean about understanding, understanding your food, understanding your target, understanding your food matrix. Um, we know niacin is bound uh, by carrageenan, for example. So when you're using carrageenan in your food, you have to be careful how you add niacin because you don't want it to be tied up by the carrageenan. Niacin is also concentration dependent. When it binds, it binds. There's no reversal of that. <clears throat> so you can titrate it out of your, uh, of your matrix by having a whole lot of cells. So more cells require more niacin to control. Natamycin is the, is the other uh, molecule I want to talk about. This is um, not produced by lactic acid bacteria. It's not a bactericin, but it's been around for a while. It was, it was approved back in the 70s for use as a food preservative. The reason why is because it is very, very powerful against yeast and mold. It's actually produced by a soil bacteria, Streptomyces natalensis. It was discovered in South Africa, um, very fortuitous. One thing that's very also very nice to know about this is that over the years that it's been used as a food preservative, no one has been able to define any resistance, the yeast or molds, to this. It's very, very antifungal. It irreversibly binds to ergosterol and other sterols, which are, are that define the fun, fungi or the fungus cell membrane. It's very specific to fungi. Um, so these sterols are not found in our cells. Remember, whenever you, you, you're looking for specific activity against yeast and molds, those are, your, your, those are eukaryotic cells, and so are we. So you worry a lot more about the toxicology. These cells are so these, this molecule is so specific uh, to yeast and molds uh, that it's, it's been approved. Uh, it's been used for a long time. The major use for this is as a topical um, treatment for cheese, natural cheese. If you go in the store and you get a bag of shredded cheese, shredded cheddar or whatever, look at the ingredient statement. 90 plus percent of those have natamycin as the last uh, ingredient, which also goes back to what I said originally. Natamycin has to be labeled, so does nicin. They are purified molecules and they have to go on the label to identify what they are. But they are natural, they're fermentation based. Uh, this is fungicidal, particularly against yeast are more sensitive to molds. Effective concentrations between one and 20 parts per million. They're effective at a very, very low level. But they're also low in water solubility. So if you apply it as a topical spray, you have to worry about the uh, suspension, or the, it's not a solution, it's a suspension that you spray, you don't want it to settle out. So there are some considerations for use in um, the food manufacturing plant. It's highly regulated, uh, only certain classes of food are, are, have been approved. Natural cheese, bakery goods are the two biggest. It's not approved in meat in the United States. Um, and there's a few other foods that, that you can use it in the formulation. This is what it looks like. Uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. Uh, it's relatively re uh, resistant uh, to heat, 50 to 100 degrees C. Um, it works very well at neutral pH. Uh, it is inactivated at very low pH. Uh, below pH 3, it starts breaking apart. Um, but uh, it's also, because of its structure, it's, it's uh, not stable to UV light, uh, peroxides, oxidants, things like that, things that can break up, break up these double bonds. Mechanism, um, it is an antibiotic type mechanism. If you think about, okay, what's the difference between an antibiotic and an antimicrobial? Well, in general, when you look at an antimicrobial, the way I define it, the way uh, uh, Codex defines it, it's a, more of a physical disruption. Nicin punches holes in the membrane. Uh, it's a, so it's, there's a nonspecific uh, activity. It's, it's really just ripping that cell apart. Um, An antibiotic is, has a biochemical means of, of disruption. So it'll, it'll attack DNA replication or protein synthesis or things like that. Um, 
There's more that's being studied uh, about natamycin, but we do know it interferes with cell division and, and enzyme function. Um, it is fungicidal, so it kills, and it doesn't just stop the growth, um, and effective concentrations are very low. Again, um, advantages, it's natural, easy to apply, however, it does have to be labeled. Uh, resistance doesn't naturally occur, effective at very low concentrations. Uh, less than a year ago, if you, I don't know if you remember the, the press releases that Kraft came out with. Uh, they started putting, uh, they, they made their cheese slices, their processed cheese slices, all natural. And they, were, they, were, they announced that they were using natamycin instead of sorbate. They had replaced it. And so now they could call those natural. And um, so that, that's one of, well, it's on the label, you can call it natural, but it's not a clean label. Okay. No effect on bacteria. That's good if you're only attacking yeast and mold. It's also good if you're using it in a uh, cultured dairy product, for example, or a cultured meat product, if you're going to use it in meat. You don't want to kill the starter cultures. You want to kill what's, what's, in, uh, what's spoiling your food. Low solubility prevents migration to food, so it remains on the surface when you spray it on the surface. That's important because that's where molds grow. Molds tend to grow on the surface. They need oxygen to grow, and you don't want a... Uh, a topically applied antimicrobial to migrate into your food, as would uh, organic acids. No adverse effects on taste, odor, or appearance. Okay, I'm going to go a little faster here. I like to talk. You might, you might have guessed that by now. Um, but please, if somebody wants to interrupt me, please interrupt me. Natamycin, yeah. Natamycin, if you look on the label, it says natamycin in parentheses, a natural mold inhibitor. That's Which, typically what you'll see. So I, my thought is, well, why isn't that clean to me? I, as a consumer, not knowing any better, maybe in the actual terms, I think of that as a clean label. You told me you did something natural that makes my product better. Yeah, but a, a clean label means that the consumer can look at it and not be confused okay. in general. And the, you're always hearing about these big chemical words on there, they don't want them because they, they, they don't know what it is. And um, you've heard of the food babe? Go to her blog sometime. Okay. Eric, you mentioned all the advantages of uh, natamycin. It really works really good on cheese. Yes. But why, do you know why it's uh, so expensive? Because the fermentation is a very complex, a submerged fermentation. It's, uh, it's a very difficult fermentation. It takes place over many days. Uh, so it's hard, and, it's, and the fact that it's insoluble, basically insoluble, it's hard to get the yields that you need. Um, if we could figure out a way to, to produce it easier, we would. Um, we don't want to put in another organism because nobody wants to buy GMO, right? So. Uh, so we produce it in its natural host, and uh, over the years that's been a challenge. It's, it's just very, yeah, it's very expensive. That's one I was alluding to, uh, that's very expensive, but, but you use it at a very low level, so you have to kind of weigh those together. Um, organic acids as antimicrobials. Uh, we like organic acids because they're easy to, uh, uh, to, to grow, they're easy to, to produce by fermentation. Uh, we do like a couple or, or organic acids better than others. We like acetic acid and propionic acid because these acids have uh, better antimicrobial properties than other organic acids, natural organic acids that, uh, that we've looked at. And the reason for that is right here. It's the pKa value, the dissociation constant. So acetic acid, propionic acid have pKa's uh, at the high fours, okay? 4.76, 4.87. What is a pKa? That's the pH at which 50% of your organic acid is dissociated and 50% is undissociated. And guess what? Only the undissociated form of the acid is antimicrobial. And also guess what? That dissociation is affected by pH. So organic acids are very, very much affected by the pH of your food. So 
Uh, lactic acid is the, is the other acid I put up here by com for comparison. That can also be used as an antimicrobial. However, its pKa is much lower. So to put that in perspective, at pH 5, 35% of acetic acid and 43% of propionic acid are undissociated. Only 6% of lactic acid is undissociated. You go to pH 6, it gets even worse. 5.2 and 6.9 of these two acids versus 0.6. So again, it's a, you remember the pH is a logarithmic scale. So that as you go up in pH, it changes exponentially. So the higher the pH, the less effective your, your uh, organic acids are as antimicrobials. And why is that? Um, again, the undissociated form, that's when the carboxyl group has the proton uh, or the hydrogen ion on it. <coughs> the dissociated form is your carboxyl ion has given up its proton, okay? So if we look at a cell, and in, in general, a cell maintains an internal pH in order for its internal mechanism to work uh, around neutrality. And how does it do that? It, it does that by pumping hydrogen ions or protons in and out of the cell through this uh, what's called a proton pump. Um, and it also uses this as an energy generator. Okay, this also generates ATP and it allows that cell to perform. Okay, it's like it's breathing, okay, if you want to put it that way. So, um, so the internal pH, depending on what the external pH is, is maintained through this kind of a mechanism. What happens if you add organic acid properties? Well, in order for that organic acid to be antimicrobial, its R chain or its uh, side chain needs to be small enough so that it can pass through the membrane. It needs to have lipophilic properties, so to speak. But it also has to be undissociated. So an undissociated acid has a net neutral charge. This would have a net neutral charge and is able to penetrate the membrane of the cell. If you dissociate it, it has a net negative charge. The carboxyl group no longer has a proton. And the cell having a net negative charge will repel it electrostatically. So it's the, it's the, diso, it's the um, undissociated form that's able to penetrate the cell. But what happens when you go from the outside to the inside? You're going from a lower pH to a higher pH. So as soon as that molecule goes into the cell, the, the proton pops off. It dissociates. And what does that do? That drives up the concentration of hydrogen ions on the inside of the cell. The cell looks at that and goes crazy and says, well, I got to get these hydrogen ions out of here. And so that pump becomes one way. So it's, it's maintaining its, its ability to, to remove those protons, but it's not taking any in. And so we call that a, a starvation state. It's basically, it's no longer producing energy. It's using all of its willpower, so to speak, just to stay alive. If you remove the uh, organic acids from the environment, then that cell can recover. So that's why we, we say it's static. It prevents or it slows down the growth of cells. It generally doesn't kill that cell, at least right away. Okay? If you leave it in the starvation state long enough, yes, eventually you will have cell death. So just a couple words about protective cultures. Um, back, to this, back to this diagram. Again, we're, we're, we're up here. We purified. But if you now grow them and you produce a, 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 a starter culture or an adjunct culture, you can call that a protective culture. Uh, basically, these are bacterial species for food that have grass status, typically lactic acid bacteria are specifically selected for the ability to control unwanted microorganisms. So these are the ones that you find that have, have nice antimicrobial properties, and you select them for no or little adverse effect on the sensory quality. What does that mean? Basically means you can only use them in cultured foods. So you use them in foods that already have a starter culture, you use them as an adjunct culture, because if you put it in an uncultured food, you're gonna end up with a fermented food a lot of times. Um, so you produce biomass, you concentrate them. They're labeled as cultures. So if you already have a cultured food, they become transparent. You don't have to label them. Uh, definition of culture, greater than or equal 10 to the eighth live cells per gram that in the package that you put into your food. So that's it.
Now I want to talk about one more part of this diagram right here. Okay, and when we, we focus on that, when we grow the, the, the culture up in a fermenter, and we get to this point, and we don't purify anything, we just stop right here, we have what we call fermentates. Okay, what is a fermentate? A fermentate is just that. You take the culture, you grow it up in a fermenter to the end of fermentation, you kill the cells, you condense, you spray dry, you standardize to the activity of the original cell, you've got a food ingredient, you've just created a cultured food ingredient with antimicrobial properties. You're using it to deliver the properties of the original cell. So you grow this in a food, you've got a cultured or a fermented food and you can use that as, a, uh, as, a, uh, as an ingredient. So the regulatory aspect of this is a little bit clearer path than a purified antimicrobial. It's faster to get regulatory approval. Uh, there's a bunch of these on the market that are being used, uh, not just by us, but by, by several companies uh, that, that do this. So we call these raw concentrates obtained from cultivation of food grade protective cultures in food grade substrates. They're unpurified, they're heat inactivated after fermentation, condensed and spray dried. So the dead cells are even in there. Every, we don't take anything out, it's unpurified. The antimicrobial action is due to production of metabolites and the two that why we're, we're so interested in bactericins and organic acids, those are very prevalent in lactic acid bacteria. We can focus on those. Propionibacterium is what we use to produce the, the acetic and the uh, propionic acids. Um, Lactococcus lactis, subspecies lactis, we make fermentates out of them to produce the bactericins. Uh, so we can, we can tailor make these things to, to, uh, to go after whatever we're trying to go after. Labels are clean, well, well, clean. Cultured dextrose, cultured skim milk is what you see on the label generally. Um, cultured wheat starch or cultured wheat, wheat flour, cultured corn sugar, you, you see. So, so those are considered friendlier labels than natamycin or nicin, for example. These have actually been used very nicely to uh, augment hurdle technology. Remember, antimicrobials are hurdles. They're not a means by themselves. They're used in hurdle technology to give you enhanced, uh, enhanced power over control uh, of your food. Um, they're generally used to protect, pr protect the organoleptic property of food products. Uh, and to extend the shelf life or pre prevent spoilage. And it's been shown from time to time that you can actually start looking at the other hurdles, reducing the processing temperature a bit, allowing less uh, acid, raising the moisture. So w what are you doing when you do that? You're, in, you're increasing or you're, you're enhancing the organoleptic property of that food, but you're still your target is still to get the same quality or safety at the end. So the more hurdles you have, the more you can adjust those to get to the end point that you're looking for. Clean label, cultured skim milk or cultured dextrose, sometimes maltodextrin. Uh, maltodextrin is used as a drying agent for the cultured dextrose part. Uh, skim milk is typically used as a drying agent for the cultured skim milk. Uh, natural, um, and people have looked at these uh, to replace or to partially replace synthetic or chemical additives. Now, I am in my hour, and I have some, my last few slides are data slides, so let's take a poll. Who wants me to quit now? <laughs> oh please, oh please, no, no, no. Like I said, I like to talk, and I'm sorry about that. I tend to get off on tangents sometimes. Well, they're, they're familiar with over talking. Uh, I know. I come to, from the Pete Muriana School of, of Presentation. Actually, we both, we both come from the same school, our major professor. So I just want to show you some examples of how these antimicrobials can work. Okay? And, and in no particular order, again, these are just data slides. Um, here we have the effect of the antimicrobial agents on the growth of penicillium species in yogurt. This was a study we did years ago for a, a yogurt company where we actually surface inoculated yogurt with a penicillium species from yogurt. And uh, we, we formulated those, those uh, yogurts with different antimicrobials. 
The control is here. Uh, one of our fermentates uh, is here. We had uh, potassium sorbate as, an, as another control, which is right here. And then natamycin, our natamycin product, um, which is right here. So you see uh, about two and a half logs here when we, did a, uh, when we looked at the whole mass. That's about where you saw mold starting to, to appear on the surface. That's, that's when it became visibly uh, uh, noticeable. So here we have about 10 days, or probably as actually eight to nine days uh, in the control. Um, with sorbate and with uh, natamycin, um, we got close to 50 days before that mold appeared. And again, we, we inoculated this mold at about 10 to the, oh no, it was, about a, it was 100 spores per, uh, per mil. And the fermentate, which is, again, it's not a purified antimicrobial, it's a delivery vehicle for antimicrobials. You expect that to be somewhere in the middle, and we did. We saw probably about 30 days of the shelf life compared to the control. So you can see how you can start making choices with these. Here we have a fermentate uh, versus yeast and sour cream. This was a naturally contaminated one. We did not inoculate this. Uh, after seven days in the control, uh, again, this was at 45F. We started seeing outgrowth of the, of the yeast, um, whereas the, the fermentate held it in check for 21 days before it started going. So this is very similar to that hurdle graph that I showed you, right? You have an extended lag phase, but now you're extending the, uh, the shelf life. Um, pathogen control, Listeria monocytogenes and Bolognese sauce with, with a nicin uh, preparation or a fermentate. Again, I'm trying not to do brand names, but I couldn't change these slides. Um, so the control, you see th these were inoculated about two and a half logs. Uh, you can see at 10 days, uh, we're up eight and a half logs. Um, as, you, as you go up in the concentration, so you have, this is a fermentate at 0.2%, this is a fermentate at half a percent, um, so at, at 0.2%, you, you get a, a lag, and then it starts growing, but it outgrows, the listeria grows just fine. But if we increase the concentration, uh, we pretty much get a static effect here. Um, with the nicin preparation, we either went in at 100 or 250 uh, parts per million of the nicin preparation. Um, and you can see here that uh, the 100, although it, it gave a little bit of a, an effect, it, it really allowed growth, but so if we went up just a little bit, we were able to, to hold it in check, okay? And on and on. This is a, a, a blend of fermentates that we used uh, against uh, Listeria Challenge and chicken salad, and you can see as we went up 0.5 to one to one and a half percent, we were able to control the growth of Listeria, and here's the control. Talking about essential oils, we do have an antimicrobial that contains mustard, white mustard essential oil. And we use that uh, to control outgrowth of yeast and mold. Uh, very limited in its use to savory products uh, because you can pretty much taste that mustard. Um, so in barbecue sauce, uh, uh, we use sorbate as a control uh, and in no antimicrobials, you can see that uh, our, our blend here worked beautifully and just as good as potassium sorbate, but now it's a natural blend, uh, labeled natural flavors and cultured dextrose. Same thing in ranch dressing, uh, low pH, again, these are low pH foods, so uh, we do get better effect of the organic acids at low pH. Uh, you see that, um, again, sorbate and uh, this uh, blend work pretty much uh, in concert. They, they, they work equally well. Again, natural versus chemical label considerations. Um, and finally, I, I want to uh, stop with um, listeria control and processed meats. And when I first joined Danisco, one of the challenges was the new uh, directive from FSIS on the control of listeria and the definition of alternative one, alternative two, and alternative three. So that was everybody's, that was in everybody's head. We need alternative one. Alternative three, if you're, who's familiar with, with that terminology? 
Um, in, in general, FSIS came out, the meat processors, and said, okay, this is for processed meat for post-processed contamination of listeria. If you don't do anything, if you rely on GMP, sanitation, whatever, that's alternative three. Now, if you put in interventions, if you put in an intervention that actually shows inactivation of listeria in a validation study, if you can show at least one log reduction at the beginning, and actually they, they like two logs, then that would be one of the, the criteria for getting alternative one or alternative two. The other criteria is in the validation, if you're able to control the outgrowth of listeria over the shelf life so that, and in these meats, these validations were like 90 days long. They, they want to control, that's the shelf life the industry is looking for, out to 90 days, so 80, 90 days. If you can control in a validation the outgrowth of listeria to less than two logs, two logs or less, then that'll be another criterion for the alternative one, two, or three. If you have one of those two, either the sidle effect or the static effect, you have alternative two. If you can show both of these, then you have alternative one. And, and, and the, the thought was, if you get these things under control, we will leave you alone. I mean, we won't show so much uh, oversight as far as inspections and things like that. Let the industry start uh, in, uh, governing themselves. Uh, but really, alternative one is very, very hard to get. And so FSIS would question a company if they got alternative one and say, well, we're going to inspect you anyway because we don't believe you. So alternative two is really where the industry headed for. So we developed an antimicrobial blend that worked really well in cured meats, hams, hot dogs. If it had nitrite in it uh, as a hurdle, it worked very well. And so we had this, we had this blend for, for many years, but the challenge was when, when we put this into an uncured meat, so say roast turkey or turkey loaf, something like that, it failed miserably. It would not hold the listeria down in uh, validations. So we developed over the course of eight years, we developed a blend, which we, we actually commercialized last year. Uh, and we call it this CDV, and it's really cultured dextrose and dried vinegar, buffered vinegar. And you can see we worked with a company out in California uh, in their products, um, in their plant to do a validation. Uh, this was, these were diced chicken strips right off of their, uh, uh, their formula and made at their, at their plant. And this was uh, lactate diacetate that they were using as their intervention. And so when we, when we did a challenge study, and this is just outgrowth data, the control uh, grew out to, by 70 days, we were up close to six logs of outgrowth. The lactate diacetate held it in check for about 30 days, and then it, it pretty much grew about the same way, the same, the same rate. But our product, we were very surprised to see how well it worked actually held it over seven days, actually even started decreasing it over time. So we wanted to see if this was real. We did this in an oven roasted turkey, 33% uh, extension, another one of their products uh, at two different levels, one and a half and one percent, and you can see basically the same thing. Lactate diacetate and control and uh, the blend. So take home message here is that Purified or single antimicrobials don't always work well if you can start blending them together and looking for synergies and looking for how they work together. That's how you're going to get the control you're looking for in your food. Um, so with that, I'll take any questions.